Later. And I'm Laura Ingram. This is the Ingram Angle. We have an incredible jam packed hour for you. Everything from the left's war on the law to the supernatural. Yes, we're talking exorcism. The people of California are rebelling against the sanctuary state there. And President Trump calls it a revolution. And we've got a candidate for governor helping lead the charge. Plus, the angle dig digs up the truth on whether the catch and release policy by Border Patrol agents is really over. Meanwhile, Jim Comey's whiny tour of leftist media outlets makes him sound like a mean girl who was dumped by the president. And you will see rare footage, yes, of an actual exorcism. Raymond Arroyo has a must-see interview with exorcist director William Friedkin about his chilling new documentary on the Vatican's legendary exorcist. Also, the president fields questions ranging from talks with North Korea to whether he will fire the special counsel. Mike Huckabee will give us his usual insightful analysis. But first, Starbucks in black and white. That's the focus of tonight's angle. Never has a request to use the bathroom caused so much havoc. Last week, two black men were awaiting a meeting at a Starbucks and they asked to use the bathroom, but they were told no, because it was reserved for customers and they had bought nothing. So they returned to their seats and because they had purchased nothing, they were then asked to leave. Well, they didn't and the manager called 911. Hi, I have two gentlemen in my cafe that are refusing to make a purchase or leave. Um, I'm at the Starbucks at 18th and Spruce. All right, please, I'll be honest as possible. The two men were arrested, but not before it was all captured on a phone and then it went viral. Well, soon a Starbucks boycott campaign raged across social media. Activists rushed to the offending Starbucks shop and others as, as well, and hashtags such as Starbucks while black started trending big time. And within a day, Starbucks had apologized. And then two days after the incident, the manager who called 911 was no longer with the company and its founder, Howard Schultz, described her this way. And I think you have to say, and looking at the tape, that she demonstrated her own level of unconscious bias. And in looking at the tape, you ask yourself whether or not that in fact was racial profiling. There's no doubt in my mind that, yeah. that the reason that they were called was because they were African American. There's a lot we still don't know. And here are some questions. Was there a pattern of racial bias in this Philadelphia Starbucks? Were other African Americans treated unfairly there? And did this particular employee display a pattern of practice, practice of racism in the past? Or was she just enforcing company policy by denying the bathroom to non-customers and trying to stop some loitering? Because that's also not good for business. Well, the call to the cops seems like overkill. But again, we don't know the full story. As Starbucks faced these demonstrations all over the country, there was a rush to judgment and the company quickly jumped on it and a lot of people think went overboard. Rather than just apologizing and disciplining an out of line employee, Starbucks announces that it was closing 8,000 stores for one day in May. And on that day, they will force 170,000 of its employees to undergo racial bias training. According to the Washington Post, the sessions will include training in something you might not know of, but it's called unconscious bias, where apparently you're unaware of your inherent biases. You display no overt racism, but you are biased nonetheless. The training will be guided by, wait for it, former Attorney General Eric Holder, the NAACP, and anti-defamation legal officials. What could possibly go wrong? Holder, of course, has his own history in discussing race. In things racial, we have always been, and we, I believe, continue to be, in too many ways, essentially a nation of cowards. That was how he introduced himself to the Justice Department when he became Attorney General, by the way. And this is the man who will conduct a training on race relations of 175,000 employees. Okay. So this is where we are. One employee in Philadelphia calls the cops on a pair of black men and employees across the nation are kind of assumed to be latent racist. Starbucks is one of the most 
liberal companies in the world. You think Ben and Jerry's kind of here on the level of left, left wing, Starbucks is up here. Look, they support Planned Parenthood. They've hired refugees as a protest against President Trump's policies. They forced baristas to address race relations with customers a few years back. Remember they were made to scrawl that hashtag race together on coffee cups? Well, but if the coffee chain thought that it was going to inoculate itself against liberal ire by being left-leaning, they were wrong. Their progressive, supposedly inclusive identity just made them an easy target for protesters. By the way, a comedian, I didn't even know this, I thought it was for real earlier today, but a comedian is gonna join us later he decided to see just how far liberal guilt would go in Starbucks. So he found his way into a Starbucks and he demanded reparations. I heard y'all was racist, so I came to get my um, free coffee. I saw that. Yeah, I heard you guys don't like black people. So I wanted to get my Starbucks reparations Not voucher. Our What's that? Is that a real thing? It's a real thing. I mean, I'll give it to you. I, yeah, I saw that on my Twitter last night. She gives him the coffee. I think he should have just asked for the entire espresso machine or at least a venti frappuccino. <laughs> yeah, whatever you want, take it. The question all of this begs is the following. How just is it to subject all Starbucks employees to the high paid indoctrination of the racism industry because of the actions of one employee? And will this actually strengthen race relations or could it actually deepen division between the races? If we're not careful and if we don't refuse to get all the facts and if we don't refuse to be bullied by activists who jump to the worst motives, worst conclusions about people right off the bat, well, we may just end up doing the opposite of what we want to do. We may end up poisoning the well further in this country, and we may be encouraging more mob takedowns of well-intentioned people or organizations, or people who just make mistakes. And that's the angle. Joining me now for a reaction from Houston is Horace Cooper, co-chair of Project 21. And here with me in studio is Jamila Bay, a radio talk show host. It's great to have both of you on the show. Wow, this is wild. I did this on radio this morning and I got people from all over the country burning up the lines. So a lot of people go to Starbucks and a lot of people love Starbucks. And a lot of people see signs and establishments that say, restrooms are for customers only. And I wonder if that sign itself is no longer going to be uh, you know, valid if that sign can never be enforced. Jamila. The sign absolutely can be enforced. Um, if you're not making a purchase or you don't plan to make a purchase, uh, you shouldn't be in a seat taking up space from patrons. The issue with this particular Starbucks is not that uh, the gentlemen who were not just random black dudes sitting there, these were, uh, these are rather businessmen. These are real estate uh, investors or you know well, no one should be discriminated no, against it doesn't all. matter if they're but, businessmen or well, well no it, do, it doesn't matter in this case however when we hear that holly the manager who's no longer there was afraid because before some vagrant had chased her around when she asked the person to leave um that she can't tell the difference in a pair of gentlemen discussing their business while they're waiting for their third business partner to come in um i have a question why know, don't they just buy like a two buck cup of coffee if they're these high-powered businessmen, well, just know, buy a cup of coffee. Well, fine, buy a cup of coffee. Get a water, a bottle of water. Dictate, etiquette dictates that, you know, you, you wait for your buddy. They The first thing, they're, they're going, oh, yeah. well, okay, fine, he's coming. You know, they they just, offered to call yeah. their friend. They offered to corroborate. It seems like, yeah, it seems that like, was overkill. I don't know, do, so, but we don't really know much about this Holly, if that's her name. We don't really know much about her, do we? we well, yeah. We know she's no know, longer, we she's know like she's vaporized. No longer she's there. no longer uh, there. The, the online investigators whomever they may be pulled up some tweets with her uh, expressing not liking people who speak Spanish in her store. Um, well, and, that's, uh, you, well, know, you hear that a lot across the country. A lot of people think in, in, in a lot of people in Spain, when you go to Spain, they don't like it when you don't speak Spanish because I've been subjected to that. But and I actually, Philadelphia, I we're actually talking celebrate about Starbucks. Them. Yeah, but I you actually know. celebrate people when they don't, they're mad at me for not speaking their language. Uh, but let's talk to you, Horace. It, it seems like, look, this, this could have been handled better. I don't think it was handled well. But my problem is, why does this mean the entire chain has to shut down for one day? Like, Howard Schultz can do whatever he wants. 
But there are a lot of people making a lot of money off of inherent uh, racial bias training and other such racism training sessions. Uh, it's a big business. Racial uh, separatists are doing everything they can to exploit anything that they find. This is an example of the emperor's new clothes. We don't have to have real conscious misbehavior. We have unconscious bias. We have implicit bias. I want to make some news tonight. Our organization this week is going to be contacting the EEOC and the Department of Justice, and we're going to ask them to see to it that any employer that is going to punish, penalize, or in any way uh, interfere with the right of their employees to operate without detecting whether or not they have some unconscious bias will be found in violation of Title VII. This absolutely must not be allowed to occur, and it is not just a little overstep. This is dangerous, and that's why we have civil rights laws to stop this kind of behavior. Jamila. Shockingly, I think uh, I think Horace makes a really great point. Um, here's the thing: Starbucks is virtue signaling. They are a company that is designed to make as much money for their for their company and you know their shareholders and and interest. They're going to lose sixteen million dollars um, shutting down yeah, for a day. Yeah, they're going to have a lot of people say, "Oh, look at this wonderful company addressing implicit bias or whatever." No, here, Starbucks, take a hint from me and other wiser folks than me. You want to put an end to this? You want to make sure that everybody's treated equally? Do mystery shop. Put all of your managers on notice. If you, if if we send a mystery shopper in, a white dude dressed however, and we send a black dude dressed exactly how the white dude is, and we find that you denied one guy the bathroom key, or you gave one guy a free mocha, voca, wate, wate latte, or whatever they're Sounds called. Like what orders every <laughs> you day. Know, and you didn't give it to the other guy. If you are in violation of Starbucks policy, as we've yeah. trained you, <clears throat> we're going to fix it. Shutting the stores down is going to get Starbucks a lot of business. Wow, aren't they great? They're trying to do something for American equality and race like, relations. I, I'm, not willing to no, throw, I don't buy I'm not willing to throw people under the bus for something that we don't know the full context of. Remember That's the Michael Brown concern. stuff. The Michael Brown deal in St. Louis was horrible in Ferguson. We okay. had the whole city burn, you know, not the whole city, but blocks burned down. African-American mm -hmm. business owners had their stores destroyed. Mm -hmm. Then we find out, wait a second, this isn't exactly how it was described. It wasn't a hands up, don't shoot. It was a horrible, tragic, sad situation, okay. but the cop ended up being cleared. People jumped to conclusion, and in, the, in, the, in, in, in their jumping to conclusion without knowing the context, they started, they made okay. the problem worse. That's what I'm worried about here. And anytime and the that's issue of the race comes up, that I you have can't, to. people are afraid to say anything. They're I don't afraid. Think it's an issue of people being afraid to say anything. I do. Um, uh, Michael Brown. That's a situation that I think uh, can have its own yeah. hour. When Let's we're get talking about coffee and Starbucks. Yeah. Either you treat people the same or you don't. If you want to make it, you're difference. having a good idea. I like your idea. We of the, don't of the random send stops. mystery Laura. shoppers. Go ahead, Horace. Laura. We don't have evidence of what actually happened. It could have been an accident. It could have been a misunderstanding. It could even have been intentional. But before we could get any of that information, people have rushed to condemn one of the most liberal, left-leaning corporations in the country. They were so for President Obama twice. They did yeah. everything they could. Didn't and matter. yet, and yet we're <laughs> supposed to we're supposed to believe that without any information, let's just assume evil racism is at work. This is dangerous. It's a poison, and it is dividing our country. I absolutely think that we overreacted in this situation, well, and I think we this, ought to have waited I think for the information out of time. to come yeah, out. Guys, I think she actually, again, depending on the facts, she could have an unbelievable defamation claim against Howard Schultz, but I'm sure he's paid I up on so all this uh, huge defamation possibility. Again, I don't know all the or facts. Not. I'm just could could have a huge defamation case. Thank you both. And now in the angle, I told you about someone who wanted to see just how far Starbucks liberal guilt would go. 
His video has gone completely viral, so we asked comedian provocateur Brian Sharp to join us this evening, and there he is. Hey, Brian, how are you? Hey, Laura, how are you? You totally fooled me, okay, because <laughs> I played this on my radio show this morning. My producers and I were screaming. We're like, this sounds... If I didn't know better, it sounds like you sound like Chris Rock. It, it, you, you, it's so funny. And that poor girl in Starbucks is ready to turn over the keys to the shop to you. She was so worried. Uh, but tell me why you did what you did uh, by asking for reparations going into that Starbucks and saying, I want my free coffee for what you did basically in Philly. She said, oh, OK, I'm giving you, I'm giving you the coffee. Why did you do this? I am sick and tired of liberals using black people and making us look like victims, making us look soft with their liberal dogma. It is disgusting. The other thing I hate about liberals is if you're a black man, as I am, in America, they will not hand you a microphone unless you follow the liberal narrative. And I said, you know what? I bet if I go into Starbucks and I follow a liberal narrative, I'll make the news. And voila, here I am. Performance art. Now, did you, did, when you talked to her when you went in there and you had it on the cell phone, the young woman says, well, yeah, I think I saw that on Twitter. Like, she actually thought there was something on Twitter that any time a black person came into Starbucks, you just had to hand them a coffee. And we're wondering, why did you just go for the coffee? Why didn't you go for, like, the entire, you know, in a blender to make those fancy smoothie drinks. I mean, you she just went, went for the regular coffee. You should have really upped the ante there. She went straight for the venti. I have to give Amanda props. She went for the venti. I got a large. She gave me milk. I should have asked for almond milk. And she did give me caramel with the sugar in it. So Are you, get, so, are you I, getting I, I, grief? Are you getting grief for this? From Am I getting friend, grief? Oh grief for this from friends, liberals, saying, how dare you do this? This is a serious issue. And now you're making light of it. How dare you? Like I said in my book on booksbybrian.com, you're going to get enemies and, and you have to learn how to use them. I have a chapter in my book that talks about how to use enemies and I know how to use them. So I embrace the hate. I embrace it because it, it, it gets balanced out with love. But all the people that hate, they're just brainwashed by liberals. That's all it is. They're, they're afraid to think for themselves. They we have don't... a longer clip. Brian, hold on, because we have a longer clip, because people who somehow missed the top of the show. Okay. I want to play the longer clip if we can. Bring that can back. Can we? Yeah. Oh. Can we play the original clip just again one more time? Because I'm sorry, it's screamingly funny. I want to play it one more time. Let's watch. <laughs> Okay, just one second. Anyway, so we, you go into the Starbucks. Did you pick the Starbucks for a reason or just any random Starbucks? I happened to just be there. The thought, the idea was already in my mind. Oh I just happened gosh. to be there. I was with my family, as you saw my son in the video, and I was like, oh my God, a Starbucks. And you I just said, did you know this off, You did this off the, off the top of your head. Off the top of my head. Oh my gosh. I thought you planned it out. Here we go. Get my free coffee. Y'all ready? Are you ready? Yeah, we're saying. Y'all ready? Yeah, yeah. Okay, this was okay. They, this, we thought this was planned out and scripted, Brian. Great stuff. Thank you so much. Uh, we may, by the way, be hearing the first rumblings of a political earthquake in California. Up next, the growing number of fed up citizens there fighting back against the sanctuary state. And later, you know how scary the film Exorcist was? Well, the man behind it joins us with this new documentary that'll show you the real thing. Don't miss it. It's the ace. Buy one, get one free. President Trump sees the, sees the tide shifting dramatically against California Governor Jerry Brown. His state sanctuary law and Brown's refusal to use National Guard troops to stem illegal immigration. Trump tweeted today, there's a revolution going on in California. So many sanctuary areas want out of this ridiculous crime infested breeding concept. And Jerry Brown is trying to back out of the National Guard at the border, but the people of the state are not happy, want security and safety now. And the president may have the numbers to prove it. Nearly 20 jurisdictions in California have announced their opposition to the state sanctuary law. Let's debate these developments in the Golden State with Republican candidate for governor John Cox and the border angels founder Enrique Morones. Great to see both of you. All right, Enrique, let's start Great with you. With you. Um, Let's start with you on this issue of the National Guard at the border. Um, you know, not all governors are, are wild about it, I'm sure. Uh, but initially, uh, Jerry Brown said, I guess, 400 uh, troops would 
take part in this effort. Um, but he made it clear that there's no wall. I guess they're not going to build a wall. Well, we know that. But they're not going to enforce immigration laws. And now this whole thing has reached a fever pit pitch. Don't you think the fact that all these counties are worried about the sanctuary laws infecting their, their safety, isn't that a bad harbinger for, uh, for where this is going? Uh, not at all. I'm glad David Hogg let you back on the air, by the way. But uh, I'm with the majority of Californians. Oh, we don't want to have a wall. We support the sanctuary state situation. The fact that Republican uh, you know, small groups within California are opposed to the sanctuary law, that's, that's not a surprise. But the majority of Californians support the sanctuary state situation. We realize that these undocumented people that are not criminals should not be turned over to ICE because there are people that have come in the only way they can, are risking their lives. We don't encourage that. And we know there's been a 50%, almost a 50% drop and undocumented people coming hey, into Enrique, the country in the last Enrique, five years. You might not, you might not be aware of uh, this concept. It's called facts. Let me let yeah. me introduce you uh, to uh, a you're fact. Okay? News. Come on, you're the last. Let me introduce you to a right. fact, Enrique. Take I, a I'm breath. I'm all about facts, but you're, it is important facts. you're not to about facts. Take, take take a breath. Then you shouldn't come on the show if it's not about facts. And why are you wasting our time? That's because an you're insult. the ones that insisted. Come an, on, no, you're the ones. Is it? Are you in prison? To come on. Are you in prison? Are you not Prison, a man with free about? will? I'm confused. Border Angels has no free will. But we, no, we yeah, yeah, I you said on? I couldn't. Come on. I was Enrique, Enrique, come on, Enrique, come on, Enrique, come on, come Enrique on, you if you want to get personal, back on the air. Well, Laura, let's if you want to get back personal, back Enrique, so you can sure, get personal. Huh? But you just made a statement about how the majority of Californians are not for uh, our four sanctuary yeah. cities. Right. 59 percent, 59 percent of Californians say it's important to increase deportations of undocumented immigrants. That's the no, UC Berkeley. Undocumented that's criminals. the UC Berkeley study, John Cox. Yeah, but, but, you're, but you're wrong with the facts. Yeah, they were talking about John undocumented Cox criminals. How can he say? Now. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Laura. I'm up in Sutter County, which is one of the first counties to declare their opposition to Sanctuary State. My home county of San Diego just did it yesterday. Orange County did it a few weeks ago. you got the city of Escondido. you got 20 jurisdictions around the state who have already acted. I think there are going to be more because people are sick and tired of Jerry Brown and Gavin Newsom's ignorance of the law. They're, they're, they, they really believe that people want to have MS-13 living next door to them. I don't think Enrique wants uh, gang members and drug runners to be living next door to them. We're talking about getting criminals out of California. And Jerry Brown and Gavin Newsom are favoring criminal illegal aliens over the law-abiding citizens of this state. It's got to end. And I think the people are rising up, Laura. I, I think there really is a revolution brewing, just like I think there's a revolution brewing in, in the governor's race here. And I'm going to be the next governor of this state. I don't well, even know who very, this guy is. That's very ambitious this for... Who is this Cox guy? I never even heard of him. Okay, Enrique, you <laughs> have been... Enrique, <laughs> Enrique, I just want to tell you, God bless you. I mean, I, I really I wish, wish the best for you, but you've been so incredibly rude and, and nasty since almost the first sec second of this, you know, appearance. And so I, to say I'm who honest. is he, I'm, I'm sure he doesn't know who you are. So who cares? It's a conversation which is why we actually invited you on the show to have a conversation about a where's topic your, where, that's actually your, really important. Where's your sponsors? David Hogg got rid of half of them. It's actually High really, kid, it's actually really important. And poor Enrique is trying, is, to make, this... is trying to make waves. And this is how, the sad, sad thing is, this is how the left operates. When they, I'm, when I'm they, not on the left. Yeah, you? Enrique, thank you for that insightful contribution to the, uh, to the show. You're but welcome. Laura, this is, this what, is about, this yeah, is about John, the, John, this Laura, is what, this is about the safety yeah, John, let me just let me just yeah, say something. Yeah, this is about the just, safety of yeah, security. John, hold on a second. Yeah. I just want to, it's yeah. very important yeah. for people watching the show tonight to understand that what just happened yeah. with a, a, a rabid pro-illegal immigration activist, and he is that, but we still invited him on because it's a fun to have a spirited debate. But what you just saw well, is what we talked about a, a Monday of a week ago, which was the attempt by right. the left to demonize those with whom they disagree. We didn't demonize Mr. Morones. He tried to demonize both you, John, or dismiss you by saying, who is this guy? Right. And it, they go personal because they're losing on the facts. Put up the uh, graphic one more time. Of all the counties in California 
that are rejecting the sanctuary policies. Now, Enrique and the rest of the open borders crowd will wave that off and say they don't matter. Well, I can tell you their taxes matter. The money that they spend Absolutely. to incarcerate illegal immigrants, that matters. Unless Enrique doesn't want that. But, John, I want to close out with you. In, 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 you, you know, you're a Republican running in California. The state is in real trouble. Yep. Real trouble. How can it you really get is. Democrats really to vote for you? You need Democrats voting for you. How are you going to do it? Democrats, as well as independents, as well as Republicans, all want safety and security, Laura. That's the first role of government is safety and security, and that's what I'm going to provide. The first thing I'm going to get rid of is this sanctuary state policy, and the people want it. What they also want is a state that works. I'm a businessman. I look for solutions, just like the president is doing. And I think that's what the people in California are going to vote for this November. They really are tired of the lousy roads, the lousy schools, the incredibly bad business climate with people moving out of the state, the tax burden, which is choking people. They want change. They want solutions. And people like Enrique just throw off, uh, you know, slogans. They're sick and tired of that, Laura. They really want solutions, and that's what I'm going to be talking about in this race. Uh, thank you so much, John. Love the insights. Uh, now I want to get to another serious matter on the border. Last week, Congressman Ron DeSantis made the startling claim on this show that Border Patrol agents are still basically practicing catch and release with illegal immigrants. So they cross the border, they get their information, process them, and pretty soon release them. Now let's find out what's really going on and bring in Andrew Arthur of the Center for Immigration Studies, Art Arthur, uh, Center for Immigration Studies. He, you came on radio today and it was such a great segment. You're a former immigration judge. That's correct. You're not like a pundit who just shows up on TV. You know this stuff. When people hear catch and release, it makes them crazy because it makes no sense. You come into the country, you're caught at the border, you would think that you could immediately say, bye, you're back across the border. Tell us how that is actually uh, not happening now today, despite what President Trump and Jeff Sessions has said and pledged. Well, there are three important laws that come into effect here. One is uh, the credible fear provision for the expedited removal law. If you come to the border, you get arrested for entering illegally, and you claim that you have a credible fear, you go before an asylum officer, and the fact is you have a 75 to 90 percent chance of being found to have a credible fear. We just don't have the ability to detain those people, and so you're going to be released. Do we have fewer detention facilities now at the border under this administration? Have, have detention facilities been closed down? We have the uh, same number of beds, but the problem is that, you know, when you get massive numbers of people coming over the border, you fill up those beds very quickly and you turn them over. Uh, as people are in detention. So again, you make a claim, you come across the border, everybody's pretty well versed in what you need to say to make a credible claim of persecution back in your home country, correct? That's correct, yes. So they make that claim, woman, man, teenager makes that claim, and then exactly what happens? And then uh, the asylum officer interviews them, and in 75 to 90 percent of the cases, they're found to have a credible claim. They're put into removal proceedings before an immigration judge, and generally thereafter, they're released. So, and then they go where? To the interior of the United States. And the fact is, half of those people never end up filing an asylum claim in the United States, so according never, to the Attorney General. They never file a claim, and they just stay here. And they just stay here. And now, are they, do they have temporary legal status with that, or no? They're out of legal status because they never filed a claim. They have temporary legal status until they're ordered removed, and then they and don't they have any, up. but they never show up. What, how many hundreds of thousands of people have been ordered removed but never show up for their deportation? More than 900,000. Oh, my God. People hearing this go, are going crazy. This is what President Trump said, by the way, on catch and release. Let's watch. We have the worst, worst laws. You ever think catch and release, which we're terminating very quickly. We're doing it in pieces. No, it's unbelievable. Think of this. So we have a country where if they step one foot, not two feet, if one foot hits our country, we have to take those people, gently register them, and then release them. That's exactly the problem, and quite frankly, that's what's driving people to come to the United States even today, more than 50,000 last month. Just last month, 50,000. Just last now, month. Now, these facts that people have heard tonight on this show, they don't hear. I mean, people are not aware of how big this problem is. And Art, 
I mean, it's your experience as an immigration judge. You know how this rolls, and it's, it's, it's tragic for this country, and the president has to fix this. Thank you so much. And by the way, Jim Comey's national emo tour rolls on. He's, he sounds more like a bitter ex-girlfriend instead of the former F FBI director. Details on that next. I've been caring for It's kind of a, not a nice question to ask, but is Jim Comey off his medication? Because seriously, just look at what he's been saying on national TV while hawking his book that bashes Trump. He's tweeted at me probably 50 times. I've been gone for a year. I'm like a breakup he can't get over. I'm out there living my best life. He wakes up in the morning and tweets at me. Oh my gosh, why can't Donald just get over me? Comey sounds himself more like a jilted, gossipy teenager than the former FBI director. So let's try to figure out what's going on here with former Secret Service agent Dan Bongino and Richard Goodstein, a Democratic strategist, former advisor to the Bill and Hillary Clinton presidential campaigns. Great to have both of you on. Uh, let's talk to you, Richard, first. Uh, Jim Comey is, um, is the gift that keeps on giving. There's a couple of, I love Hillary. I want Hillary never to leave her book tour. I want that to keep going on. I want Nancy Pelosi to, to hold on to that gavel, but not actually use it. And I want Jim Comey to stay out there. Your reaction to the, um, to the interview so far. So I have kind of mixed feelings about Comey. Um, I think that he cost Hillary the election. I mean, I think with the polls, both before the July press conference and right before the uh, October 28th letter, she was, um, looking good and then basically cratered after that. And, and he's admitted, uh, to his credit, he's admitted during this book tour he didn't have to do what he did. And I think he did it for the reason he's going on this book tour is so that he could basically kind of put himself front and center, the facts, the issues, the law, the policies of the Justice Department be damned, you know, if it kind of made him feel good just, and look good. I don't want to relitigate 2016, but the idea that Jim Comey cost Hillary the election, Hillary cost Hillary the election. She was a disaster candidate. The only person who probably maybe couldn't have uh, couldn't have won in, in, in the election was Hillary Clinton. And then you had Donald Trump, who was a phenomenal campaigner. He's a better campaigner than Hillary. I mean, she won the coast. She won the elites. But middle America hear Hillary and they hear like cats, uh, you know, screaming. They, they don't they don't want to hear Hillary. I'm sorry, but that's just they don't like Hillary. And I know you think Comey cost it. Just uh, but if you look at the polls. I'm just saying it, it, those were the only external events that happened where we saw the polls. But the polls are always wrong. Did. The polls are wrong. Today. But they moved dramatically right Dan, before, after Dan, those two Dan, weeks. I want to play for you a okay. soundbite. This was. Jim Comey uh, with, I think it was Savannah Guthrie, or on The View, it was on The View, talking about Andrew McCabe and the IG report. Let's watch. This is where I think the confusion comes from. Your second in, McCann, McCabe, in command, McCabe, was fired for lying multiple times within the FBI. You defended his character on Twitter. That's, that's okay. Lying is okay internally. No, it's definitely not. In fact, the McCabe case illustrates <laughs> what an organization that's committed to the truth looks like. We investigated whole... I ordered that investigation. Mm -hmm. We investigate and hold people accountable. Good people lie. I lay out in the book. I think I'm a good person where I've lied. But well, what happened to poor Mike Flynn when they say he lied, which I'm convinced, I'm not convinced he did lie in that interview, but nevertheless, he didn't, he didn't get off so easy, did he, as, uh, as McCabe might? No, and, and Laura, Comey can't seem to get his story straight on anyone, on McCabe or Flynn for that. I'm glad you brought up Flynn. You know, he's in a trans transcribed interview with Congress, Laura. I don't know if anybody's aware of this. In a transcribed interview saying that they didn't think Mike Flynn was being deceptive while the FBI arrested Mike Flynn for being deceptive, for false statements to the FBI. Comey can't seem to get his story straight. But can I just address one thing, Richard? You know I love debating Richard. Uh, he, he, I, I believe Richard. he passionately advocates for his cause. He's, he's probably smart. a super wonderful guy. But he's a little crazy on this, okay? Listen, Hillary Clinton cost Hillary Clinton the election. And saying that it was the only thing that changed was the Comey thing. No, you know what changed? Hillary Clinton decided to put a private server in her house and not go by standard State Department rules. So, Richard, again, while I respect your passion for your cause here, th that is just an absurd statement. Hillary could have avoided this entire thing by following the rules every single government employee did. So let me talk about what government employees are not supposed to do. Take Russians into the Oval Office, kick out the U.S. press, oh, and get one second. Is no, that against? And, and, and where is what regulation is that against? Doesn't answer the question. It, 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 right? It's general. Handing over state it, secrets. He 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 handed over state secrets. Of course. No, when, he's, he's just, just making told, that up. When, when, uh, listen, no, that's what Richard, Comey you did. That's what Comey did. He he gave the Russians the whereabout. He they basically let them unlock where the Israelis had embedded people right, with right. ISIS. We're getting we're getting far afield from Comey. 
Let, let's let's guys. Yeah. Let's talk about let's talk about what Jim Comey said about the Republican Party, and how the party left him. Let's watch. I feel like the Republican Party left me and people like me. I used to think that at the heart of being a conservative, lowercase c, was first that character matters and second that values matter most of all. And I don't know where that is today in the Republican Party, and so I'm just not comfortable being part of it. I think he left the Republican wait, Party when Donald wait. Trump won. Go ahead, Dan. <laughs> no, this is insane. Keep in mind, let me just tell you about the two Jim Comeys. Jim Comey, number one. In a March 2017 hearing, admits on the record, by the way, this is all on YouTube for anyone to see in front of Congress, under oath, admits that he hid the sensitive Donald Trump investigation from Congress for eight months, Laura, and avoided the quarterly briefings. Quarterly, meaning every three months for Richard and some other people may have a hard time figuring this one out, right? He hid it in the public interest because it was sensitive. Then he also admits that he leaked information to the press that would benefit him to start a special counsel investigation on the same basically sensitive information. Jim Comey is a complete fraud. Him talking about values is a joke. This guy should open up at a comedy club in New York City and get off this book tour. And by the way, he needs to get a lawyer ASAP and get off TV. All right, Richard, quickly. Look, I, I, I agree with Dan in one sense. Comey should have disclosed to the public about um, what exactly it was that, that the Trump investigation looked like. Remember, he said, I want to say what I, I said about Hillary because she'll be illegitimate if she wins. And guess what? That's exactly the boat that Trump is in by virtue of Comey not disclosing to the public about this investigation. I'm sorry, um, Dan. I, I agree that he, that Comey had an obligation to level with the public. If he was going to level with them about Hillary, he had to level with them about Trump, but he didn't. I just want to but say... But he didn't level I, with the public. Yeah, well, I, and in conclusion, what I'd like to say is I frankly am really glad the Republican Party is not you know, welcoming Jim Comey <laughs> in right now. I think that's Amen. that's the, that's really good news. He gets credit for Republican we, we Party. Everybody, I think everybody so. the on country, the panel agrees. Yeah, that the country clubber, <laughs> you know, old line establishment, like took our country down a rat hole. I'm shake with and I'm really glad. One. Okay, so woo, let's celebrate that. All right, guys, fantastic. Love you both, by the way. And the man who made the Exorcist movie, oh, that smash hit new documentary is coming out, and it's going to show you the real thing. Yes, a true case of demonic possession when we come right back. Patients frequently come to me with a pretty personal question. Is there any way... Do you ever feel that there might be another battle playing out just beneath the surface of the ones that we can see in here? A spiritual one? I feel that way. Well, Oscar-winning director William Friedkin terrified the nation in 1973 with his film, The Exorcist. Now, he's exploring the real thing. Fox News contributor Raymond Arroyo recently interviewed the director about his new documentary. Raymond, tell us about it. Well, the film is called The Devil and Father Amort. Now, Friedkin started as a documentarian lawyer many years ago. He went on to do The French Connection, of course, Bill Blighty's The Exorcist. In many ways, he comes full circle in this project, which examines the right of exorcism and possession. Here's what you can expect from the film. 500,000 Italians see an exorcist every year. This woman is one of them. Her name is Christina. She's said to be possessed by the devil. Father Gabriella Amort has been the exorcist for the Diocese of Rome for 31 years. He has exorcised Christina eight times without success. This will be her ninth. Look, some of this is genuinely creepy, Laura, and it points to a real spiritual phenomena. I sat down with William Friedkin to talk about the project and discuss how it came to be. Watch this. Mr. Friedkin, 45 years after The Exorcist, here you are back looking at exorcism. Now, you said, I found this quote from an interview, I would never do anything with demonic possession or exorcism in it, so why do this? Why do this documentary now? It was an accident, Raymond. I was in a little town called Luca in Italy getting the Puccini Prize for my work in opera. <laughs> I wrote to a friend of mine who was a, a Catholic theologian. Uh, named Andrea Manda in Rome, and I asked him if he could get me a meeting 
for, for, with either the Pope or Father Amort. <laughs> and he emailed me back immediately saying, well, Father Amort is available, would be happy to meet mm. you, so I went to meet him. And Father Amort was the lead exorcist, of Rome's exorcist for many years, trained 31. 300 exorcists. Yes, his title was Exorcist for the Diocese of Rome. Wow, and you, have ne you had never seen a real exorcism, but you asked Father Amort to allow you to photograph one. He agreed to let me witness one, and I pushed my luck and asked him if he would let me film it. Mm -hmm. not knowing what I would ever do with it. But he wrote, the head of the order wrote back and said, you can film it, but alone, with no lights and no crew. What did you see? This woman you call Christina in That's the documentary. Yeah. What did you see there? Her entire personality changed. She had incredible strength that was way beyond what she really had as a, a rather slight woman, 46 years old, and her entire voice and her nature and tone changed completely during the course of the exorcism. Wow. What surprised you about it? I mean, you, you are credited with really giving, in the popular culture, a vision of what an exorcism looks like, the stakes, and this battle between good and evil. Is that what you saw in reality? Yes, uh, but, you know, is the evil coming from her or directed at her? Mm -hmm. In my opinion, it was directed at her, and I'm not sure why. You took that footage to neurosurgeons.